Hey guys, we've got a lot of new preppers coming on board and people just moving out of the city, you know, trying to get away from all the, the chaos and, and the hectic life that it, that what's, what you get from the city and they're moving out into the country and they're starting to raise chickens and, and, and goats and pigs and cows and they got ponies for the kids and things like that. Uh, this stuff here was written 40 years ago. Well, what does it have to do with today? It probably has more to do with today than it did back then. But it was something that woke us up. It woke us up. Anyway, the guy says, Why in this age of urban, industrial, interdependent society would anybody write a book on survival guns? Anybody that's interested in backpacking and things like that, there's already books about that. But this is a, not about short-term emergency nor the guns which might be used to cope with it. Uh, it seems curious that a, a human experience so fundamental as merely staying alive without the support of others required a term so dramatic as survival to describe it. But consider the fact that almost 90% of the American people live in cities. Their food and clothing come from the labors of others. Various forms of energy are processed and delivered to their homes by others. The shelter they live in was probably built by others, it is protected from fire by others, and from a true an intrusion more or less by others. Because of this common interdependence, of this complex civilization, it com com completely pervades urban life, we tend to lose sight of how vulnerable we are, how unable we are through our own direct efforts to provide the core necessities which we require to support our own lives. So without really being aware of it, you have subcontracted all your life support activities to other people, corporations, government bodies, and machines. But this leads to frustration, which is symbolic of modern man. If it's life-threatening, should an interruption of these vital surfaces uh, become evident? So what would you do, say a week from next Wednesday, there was no gasoline at the pumps, no food in the supermarket, no electric power or city water, the banks were all closed, and a mob had formed in the center of town, looting and burning out of frustration and fear. Could you and your family survive for a few weeks where you are without food or water, perhaps no police or fire protection? Probably not. But a lot of these people are, are getting out of, out of town. They want to move out of the city, simplifying their own life, and they want to be able to produce their own necessities and uh, just in case there's a social disorder, or if there's system collapse, things like that. But you got to remember that farms and stuff like that make prime targets for looters flee, flee in the strife-ridden ridden cities. you got got to remember this. And when this was going on, this, when he first wrote this in early, or late 90, 90, 1997, no, 1996. Yeah. No, 1976. Uh, New York impending bankruptcy was in the headlines. And food shortages and things like that was going on. Uh, you have to prote protect yourself from possible dangers. I don't care if they're wild dogs or if they're looters or... Uh, just anything that come on on the scene. Uh, but you got to make sure that your place has has abundant water, plant and animal life, uh, food, and fuel and raw materials to construct whatever you're doing. Uh, two characteristic distinguishing mankind from the rest of humans, of, of animals, self awareness and the ability to accumulate tools in anticipation of circumstances was have not yet occurred. Uh, let's see. 
Whether or not you believe that we are approaching a catastrophic crisis, you can surely can see the pervasive effects of our society as it's fragmented, the tendency to have to enlarge our, our simple differences. As we become increasingly more fragmented to special interest groups, radical minorities, women rights organizations, labor, environmental, government apologists, all the rest, uh, it, it will diminish our tolerances for other points of view in leading to violence increasing. Uh, unless a disaster overtakes its first civilization for this reason, it's on a short fuse. Uh, I am concluded to protection of property as well as life because in a survival situation the two are associated. Horse thieves were hung in the days of the Old West not because they were more vicious than they are now, but because leaving a man without transportation on the prairie would tantamount to imposing a death sentence. Similarity, uh, property loss, particularly the theft of your food and supplies under survival conditions may place your life and that of your family in jeopardy. If it makes you squeamish of thinking of shooting at band of looters who are stealing your seed, corn, and wheat, consider that someone who deprives you of that means of existence by force is condemning you to death. Can you think of a good reason why you should prefer your death to his? Something else I want you to think about, you know, a lot of people might think, you know, they could be Spartan when they're selecting equipment, which you have to rely on food and protection over an extended period of time. If you have a fixed retreat, retreat and you can possibly afford the cost, it's simply unintelligent not to provide yourself with the best. The fact that some people might be able to muddle through with nothing but a 22, a 30 6 rifle, and a 12-gauge shotgun does not mean that such arms are enough any more than driving cross-country on a set of bald tires can be regarded as sound practice, even though it's been done before. Now, that's just some of the stuff that I'm trying to bring to your attention. Now, he's like he said, make preparations in advance. You never have trouble if you're prepared for it. Now, this was December 1976 when this first came out. Then you come out. There, there was more. And says, uh, we are simply not looking at the possibility of hard times, but at a total social collapse, complete with widespread violence, looting, firestorm, starvation, and waves of epidemic diseases. Uh, this really opened up my mind back then. You know, I, I wasn't, this is, uh, yeah, located at least 300 miles from any major city, avoid areas with population density of more than 10 people per square mile. Use a site at least 20 miles from any major highway to avoid established farming areas. Avoid resort areas for the same reason, military bases. Avoid presumed uh, nuclear targets and sites within their fault pattern. Choose a location with reasonably mild climate to growing season and don't rush into the purchase of your retreat. Now here, it says, uh, Living off the land, pipe dream of reality. Here's here's something. This this stuck in my head too. If you wait until the balloon goes up, the highways will resemble parking lots, airports will be closed or in chaos, and you will probably never reach your re retreat. If there's any game in the area, it will quickly be decimated or frightened away. And then that. Then they were getting into your survival battery. Uh, February 1977. This was more survival guns. Then, uh, outline for survival. Uh, next to your physical and mental health, the next more important thing is skill. Gun buffs often delude themselves about their shooting ability, particularly their proudness as combat pist pistol arrows. Now this is storable foods. Back this thing up a little bit. This is Mountain House. More storable foods, survival foods. 
part two. There's uh, another one, survival foods, part three. There's a little wheat grinder and stuff there. Um, but this is, they give you an idea of, you know, what the heck to do. Long-term survival is not as easy as you think. It's one thing to buy a gun or two and some storable foods, quite another to completely restructure re your entire life and your, your living. Yep, there'll probably be no warning at all unless you are living at the retreat when the first blast occurs, the odds that you will never reach it. Another advantage to relocating now is to establishing your retreat gives you focus for the rest of your plans. Compromise in the location of retreat would likely get you killed. Halfway measures will not serve. Then they had uh, uh, low down on communications. You know, handheld uh, devices. Uh, ham radio sets. Uh, shortwave survival. FM scanners. Uh, I missed a page here somewhere. Uh, yeah. Well, this is uh, your criteria for establishing your retreat should reflect your own personal requirements along with many objectives considered. Now these are Operation SAC Bomber bases, ICMB fields, uh, and support bases. This is all over the United States. Okay. Not only do you have to think about this, but you also have to remember about all the nuclear plants that are in your neighborhood. You know, who's going to take care of them if, if the balloon goes up? Hmm? Now, I've shown this a couple different times. And just to emphasize that we don't want to get to the point if we have to resort to something like this. I mean, most of us go, no, it's never going to happen. And that's famous last words of a lot of people. Uh, let's see. Uh, survival Buyer's Guide. Uh, noticed here. I mean, they have everything that you could think of. The man didn't miss much of anything when he was... Uh, To practice using storable foods in your daily menu now. Do not rely on the old saw that if you're hungry enough you will eat anything because it's proven to be tragically untrue. Such items such as ammunition, fish hooks, knives, and needles are likely to be of greater value. Uh, let's see. Here. This is foraging for survival. He's got a blow gun there. Uh, kid with a crossbow, uh, small pistol, some knives and hatchets and stuff. Digging for Jerusalem lard chokes. Harvesting small game on one's retreat should be done as selectively and officially as cheaply as possible. All birds are edible, and although a magpie like this one wouldn't be first choice, it will keep you alive. And that reminded me of my dad saying when during the Depression, Grandma would make uh, sparrow pot pie. They go out and catch sparrows under a cardboard box, and then uh, here's a snapping turtle. A couple more birds. Rabbit, rattlesnake, raccoon, duck. Beaver. Anyway, I just wanted to bring this to light. A lot of people haven't seen this stuff and know little about it, and I wanted to get some kind of a video out to refresh people's memory and to make them do some thinking. Thanks for watching.